Hi, and welcome to the closing keynote. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our closing keynote, Dr. Sean White, who's the Chief R&D Officer at Mozilla. Um, I'm especially excited about this uh, because four years ago when I was on sabbatical, Sean started the Emerging Technologies Group at Mozilla and invited me to finish up my sabbatical there, a thing that lasted until now. I'm still uh, partially working there. Um, Sean leads the efforts for next generation of Mozilla products and technologies, including programs in mixed reality, which is where I'm involved, speech, machine learning, Internet of Things, codecs, programming languages, and a variety of foundational technologies for the web. He chairs the Tech for Global Good Initiative Executive Committee. Um, before Mozilla, he co-founded Bright Spot Sky Labs and led Nokia's Hollywood and Sunnyvale Labs, where he created the Interaction Ecologies Group. Before getting his PhD with Steve Feiner at Columbia, he was Chief Technology Officer at Neo Carta Ventures, Vice President of Technology for Lycos, something many of us old timers remember, and Chief Technology Officer of WhoWare. Sean started his career as a project lead and member of the research staff at Interval Research. In addition to 30 plus peer reviewed papers and 20 plus patents grand or filed, Sean is the 2009 Tech Award Laureate for his work on computer vision-based mobile botanical species identification. He's lectured at the Stanford Program in Human-Computer Interaction and at Columbia University, mentored for Engineers Without Borders, and served as a facilitator for the Clinton Global, Global Initiative. He was awarded an appointment as a visiting scientist at the Smithsonian Institution and serves on the steering committee for uh, IEEE's ISMAR. International Symposium on Mixed and Augmented Reality that many of us are familiar with. Sean earned his uh, undergrad and master's from Stanford and his master's and PhD from CS at Columbia University. And we're really excited to have Sean here uh, to tell us his thoughts on uh, mixed reality in a connected world. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Blair. <coughs> Pardon me. Thank you, Blair. Uh, well, look, greetings, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, many thanks to the organizing chairs, the many committee members that have put this together, all the volunteers that I, I've seen and been working with, and the attendees who make this conference uh, so alive. Um, I also, as I go through this, I want to acknowledge that I'll be talking about a lot of work done by many people, um, either at Mozilla or other companies, other research institutions across the space. Um, I have a lot of gratitude for that work, but I particularly want to call out Lars Bergstrom. Liv Erickson, Greg Foder, Eva Henning, who's been organizing a lot of this um, and the teams around that. So it feels like a, a historic moment. And it's because this is the first IEEE meeting on VR actually being held in VR. And because of a global health crisis, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but first I, I wanna give some context and then talk about the challenges and opportunities of mixed reality in a connected world. For the context, um, I like to start off sometimes by showing this. I was just talking with Blair about this picture. Um, this is my first VR project uh, back in 1992. It was the placeholder project with uh, Brenda Laurel, Michael Neymark, uh, Rachel Strickland. Um, and I like to show it mostly to reflect on the beginnings, at least for me, of uh, the journey around virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, and you'll hear me use the term mixed reality in the Milgram sense to encompass both VR and AR, or I'll be more specific when I'm trying to talk just about virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, as Blair said, the, the other piece of important context is that I, I'm the chief R&D officer at Mozilla. Um, this has been an exciting role because I get a chance to look broadly at the future of the internet. Really, uh, the research on the potential directions for ways we connect to the internet in the future, like mixed reality and voice and connected devices um, and all the underlying technologies as well, um, like Rust and WebAssembly and the things that make all of that possible. And it's important to note that um, the Mozilla Foundation is a nonprofit. And what that means is that we get to choose, uh, much like in academia, to put people first. Um, we don't have to put profits above people. Uh, and that means that when we build browsers, when we build these experiments, we really get to focus on the user needs and what is best for people in society. Um, part of that means that from a long term, uh, my intention, our intention, is that eventually we are building these systems really get beyond screens. Um, and I don't mean the, uh, 
Well, you can see what I mean, right? That is, there's so much direct engagement looking down at, at our phones or our desktops and things like that, but really being able to engage directly with information in the world around us um, and the, the future of the internet that really is about people and the things that we, that we see and we encounter. It's one of the reasons why virtual reality and augmented reality excite me. Now, today I, I wanted to share uh, with you the world we like to see, some experiments we've tried and what we've learned and uh, some questions that I still have. Now, maybe I'll start off first by saying what I mean by connected. Um, this is uh, another early VR picture. Some of you may recognize Sally Rosenthal. Uh, and the system was amazing, but it just wasn't connected. That is, it was not connected to other people. It was not connected to other systems, other devices. And that has changed significantly in the last few years. That in particular, there are now around 15 million devices that can give us uh, either virtual reality, augmented reality experiences uh, in the market, in the world today. Um, and I like to actually include the 100 million cardboard-like devices. I know some people don't feel like that matters quite as much, but we still have so many people from across the globe who do not necessarily have the kind of access that uh, or can afford to have um, a high-end system, it still gives them some of the experiences. And we see this in education, we see this in uh, learning, we see this in communication. And so I like to include the 100 million as well, but there, there are 50 million that are the direct connected ones. The other part of connectedness is the world population. So when I first started working on some of this work, Blair was asking about this earlier, um, I had been at a place called Interval Research and Mary Meeker came out with a report where she said, there may be as many as a hundred million people on the internet someday. Uh, and at this point we are well above that, right? The world population, us as a connected organism is 7.8 billion people. And the internet itself has about 4.5 billion people. Now from a mission point of view and just a, a personal preference, I want everybody to be connected. I want everybody to have the same uh, privileges, the same rights, the same ways to express themselves. Um, and part of that is what we look at today. So if we want to do that, then an important aspect of this is creating a connected platform. And then what do I mean by that? Well, I tend to like webby systems, right? That is systems where uh, it is not uh, a closed, uh, gated community, but one where um, it has the characteristics of the web, right? Um, it's open. And by open, I mean anybody can create, anybody can build, anybody can consume. There aren't gatekeepers around that. Um, and so if you want to create something, all you have to do is put the tools together to do it, and it's out in the world. Um, we find this is important because there are plenty of voices that get silenced uh, when there are gatekeepers. It also means that um, the applications, the APIs, the, the ways in which we do this are more open. It also assumes connectivity because a lot of the systems, even still today, get built assuming there's nobody else out there or that the only reason you have connectivity is to download a, a, a chunk, a thing, a binary, as opposed to being able to connect directly with the world around you, um, particularly in augmented reality, but just as much in virtual reality. It's immediate. Uh, that means that if there is a new experience, uh, so for instance, if, if I'm looking at a piece of artwork on a magazine, it is not that I download something and then I wait and then I have to do this thing and then I launch it, but that the experience is there in front of me. That's another reason why I would like the web context for that. And the last part is that it's platform independent. And by that, I mean, it doesn't just run on one system. It runs on all the systems. That means that uh, as a creator, you get to reach more people. As someone who is experiencing it, consuming it, wanting to connect with other people, it is legion. It is everywhere. So what is Mozilla doing for this? Um, and to be clear, there are many researchers, organizations, companies, uh, in both industry and academia exploring this. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the experiments we have done 
uh, and then share some of the learnings from that. So it really falls into three categories. We, we have worked on browsers as uh, the conceptual model that we know best. We have hundreds of millions of people using them. And so we have experiments like Firefox Reality, which I'll talk about um, as a, a standalone system. Uh, and we have uh, systems that are built into that as the conceptual model. And we're learning a lot from what it means to let people create inside of a browser in mixed reality. We build content and tools uh, to build content. Um, in particular, the different kinds of frameworks, uh, HTML frameworks, JavaScript frameworks, the ways in which people can express themselves uh, or make new connectivity systems. Uh, there's an incredible amount of work that happens for that and a lot of standards work that happens for that as well. Um, and then the last part is really the, the social platform to support this. And I like to think of this as a first-class citizen. That is, um, if you imagine computation and our, the, the interface systems that we have as taking the social aspects as a first-class citizen, what would you do? Um, and so we have explorations in that in particular hubs, which hopefully many of you are now familiar with having tried some of it and what it looks like, but doing it in a webby way that is not necessarily, again, having to, to download something, but imagining the experience of uh, using a VR or AR system. And if you want to connect to something, just sharing that with a link. Um, and we've been able to realize that as an experiment and see where that takes us. So I mentioned Firefox reality. Um, just for a moment, I wanted to talk about what we had built here. Um, and then I'll talk about some lessons that we learned in doing that. Um, it was important for us because first we were trying to figure out if it was even possible. Right, so a systems project uh, and a systems experiment. Um, and uh, the answer is yes, it is. And as we did this, we started to uh, learn a lot more about what we can take as lessons from the web and which things are different. But the basic experience, um, if you haven't used it, uh, is that you uh, go into uh, a world, an environment, you have different uh, screens, web pages, things that you can explore, but you can enter them, right? And the whole notion of what is a web page or what is a, a realm kind of disappears and changes. And that's the part that's interesting to me and to our research teams is the conceptual models about that and how we actually have impact with that. There are a number of other aspects of that system, being able to sort of range and control what that is, being able to move back and forth between the 2D experience, which is familiar, and immersing yourself in the 3D experience. And again, a very webby quality, being able to move forward, being able to link from thing to thing to thing, rather than having to always back out of an experience. There's also another piece of this that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, which uh, uh, has turned out to be interesting, particularly for folks who do multimodal research, which is around speech and voice and how we interact with that and making that broadly available. Um, but so the, this was the, the first experiment that we did, Firefox Reality. Um, and we've also been bringing it to uh, augmented reality, both on uh, really the, the two major platforms, HoloLens and Magic Leap. Um, and it turns out there are different challenges there, um, initially technical, so systems challenges. Um, and these are platforms that we're building so that we can test out the interactions, the te technical um, sorry, the, the uh, interaction models for this. Some of them are just as simple as how do you actually render in some way that is meaningful for us to be able to test, um, both in text and vector graphics. And so we have some really amazing work using GPU rendering so that you have crystal clear images and you actually have text that you can look at from any angle and read because it's one of the use cases that people often talk about um, but never really uh, engage in reality because it's hard. Um, so what have we learned from Firefox reality? And I'm going to condense an incredible amount of work just briefly into this. Um, but first, it's possible. Right? So uh, the, the first thing that came up when we gathered a lot of stakeholders together about this uh, from a number of different companies, including uh, Google and HTC and uh, Oculus and 
even the, the quiet people in the back from Apple, um, was uh, the question about whether it was possible or not, in particular on some of the mobile form factors. Um, and it is. Uh, and there are still challenges for us to do, but we know it's possible now. Um, the other thing that we learned was that there are some incredible bridging behaviors. Um, and by that, uh, I mean that, well, as an example, I did some research on a, a thing called Lambda Moo many years ago with Diane Chiano. And one of the things we found was that people are people in different social environments. And so we're finding that people are taking some of the, the use cases, like wanting to watch a video, wanting to talk to somebody else, things that they, they had done either in the physical world or uh, on their existing desktops and bridge those in. But they're then exploring other kinds of behaviors. And I think those are interesting. We're also seeing cultural differences in how these are used. And my favorite example of this is that uh, when we first created the system, uh, we found that people were putting together the regular sort of displays. They'd look at something, they could immerse in it. But in Japan, they were narrowing all of the displays, it's kind of narrowing the worlds. And it just turned out that that was a more familiar uh, form factor for reading. And we had made it flexible enough and had the tools to do that. But again, anyone could actually edit the open source code and make that their own as well. And so it's been exciting to actually see what people make of for themselves. Now I mentioned voice earlier. Um, there is a lot of great work, uh, both from this conference, from Kai, from WIS, um, uh, on multimodal interaction. And what's been exciting is being able to actually test it in the wild and understand both what we have as the basic interaction and start to understand what people want. There was a, a foundation project that was a bit like, um, there's a game called Scribblenauts, lets you kind of type in a word and a thing is created. And uh, in this experiment, you were able to uh, say a word and the beginnings of the VR world were created. And uh, for us, voice has become uh, an incredibly important component of this. As you all know, text input, all these other aspects of the system uh, generally get added in last. And so we've, we've found that it's actually something that needs to be built into the entire world and entire system. We started off with search, it's a basic thing, but we find we need to expand that. And there's a lot of really interesting open research questions about what that looks like from a multimodal point of view. And the last is one um, about the different frames around security and privacy and the challenges there. Now, some of you may have gone uh, to the workshop uh, the round table with Diane Hospital, uh, Liv Erickson. We have a number of people who spend a lot of time thinking about this, but it's not obvious, right? That is, um, there are some things that we have learned from how to execute code anywhere in the browser um, from just building Firefox, but there are new kinds of security and privacy, especially when you can take over someone's entire sensorium and what that looks like or what data gets sent around. Because it, now that we have new sensors that are addressing gaze or your movement or what you look at, each one of those needs privacy preserving ways of providing the, the user need, the, the functionality um, without suddenly sending it off into the world. Because what we don't want is the same problems that we've already experienced at the internet. We know we can do better. And uh, so a lot of the research around that is understanding first what those challenges are. And then second, what are the approaches to do those in privacy preserving ways? Um, many years ago, there were around uh, many, maybe a decade ago, there was an interesting uh, workshop discussion actually at Ismar um, where there was some work that was shown about eye gaze and being able to control what people see where as you know, you can put up a, a motion, other pre-attentive cues and the eye goes to that. Um, and with gaze tracking, you can actually put the pre-attentive cue up in the world. I can make you look at something and then I can remove the cue before you see it. So I can actually have you look at whatever I want you to look at. Those are the kinds of things that are new forms of security and privacy issues that we really wanna be able to address. And those come up constantly. 
Now, if this is the Firefox reality experiment that we have done, um, sort of our, our probe into the world to kind of understand the, the different issues, um, then there is a, another side of this, which has been the content ecosystem. Um, and some of that is, as I mentioned before, web frameworks work. Some of that is the discovery portals. Um, some of it is how we just make sure that things work the same across the different platforms. But it has been a combination of uh, making new tools and frameworks, making it easy to do. Um, we work with 3JS, A-Frame. There's a whole body of this work where uh, I'd like to talk about this, but when I had to first learn how to do this, I think many of you too, you had to kind of get into your depth around uh, quaternions and how you actually render all of this stuff. Uh, and when my son first actually tried this out, we had already developed A-Frame, which meant that all I needed to do was write a little bit of JavaScript to create worlds. And he still had some of the same power that you have from a, a, a deeper understanding of that. And so from this, there are a number of things that we've learned. Um, first, uh, and it's not necessarily on here, but again, the web is good enough for doing all of the things that we want to explore. Um, if you look at Hello Web XR, which is, uh, runs across all the different platforms, not just the research we've done, um, uh, these are fantastic experiences. And that means that people can build and explore around, uh, around the globe. There's another thing that um, may be non-obvious, but it struck me, especially at work that I had done when uh, I was you know, publishing at 3D UI, again, I think a decade or so ago, 2006, I think it was, one of the first ones. Um, and that is that when we create these systems and these experiments, um, they weren't generally sustainable in terms of research. That is, you make it once, you make a pick ray, for instance, and I don't know how many times individuals have had to implement pick rays to do a study, but it, it's legion. And now we have frameworks where someone can create it, it's open, and now you can do research that builds on that in a much easier way. In some ways, it's the promise that we have always wanted for things to actually be sustainable and repeatable in terms of the content that we create. One of the things that we also found, and I think this is an interesting place both for research and experimentation, is that it really is a need for uh, uh, an alternative ecosystem for the creation of content. The one that we have today um, is primarily ad-based and gets sort of centralized in an interesting way. But we've been doing experiments that are more about, for instance, attention and value exchange and attention, or discovery and what there are different ways there are to discover the different worlds and content and things that are created there. And these are really interesting challenges. We've just started to scratch the surface of that. And I guess the last part is that the openness matters. Um, that is uh, when we have tech speakers or folks who are, are teaching, whether that is in Ohio or in India, you have skill sets where you have a lot of people able to actually experiment. And that, that's good both for the research community because you can get something up quickly and good for the broader community because uh, they can experiment and contribute as well. So the last one I wanted to talk about is maybe the one that is the most relevant here. Um, if there's a, a, a platform that is inherently about connection, um, and we, we look at both the, the ways in the conceptual model, the browser or some other conceptual model, the ways in which you create content for it, the tools for that, there is really a question about social interaction. And this question has been around for a very, very long time. Um, I recently had to uh, download Telnet to help my son uh, experience what Lambda Moo was. For those of you who don't know, Lambda Moo was one of the earliest text-based MUDs and Moo, it was a MUD object-oriented. It was a world that people shared and you could create things in it, but it was all text-based. And uh, it was a different conceptual model than the pure connection because it was trying to represent a spatial model. Um, in my mind, a lot of that was also happening during some of these early VR experiments. Um, and 
that had uh, significant implications for how we started to think about the, the social nature of these. And so hopefully you've had a chance to try hubs. There are plenty of other interesting uh, social VR systems. Uh, Facebook has its system, uh, Microsoft has its system. Um, there are a lot of research systems. The reason that I think hubs is interesting uh, and hopefully you do too, is that both it, it's open, it's an open code base. And so people can build their own experiments and test things out on it. Um, it's meant to be lightweight. That is as opposed to getting everybody to download big things all the time. Uh, you just share a link and it works. Uh, and it really is exploring the different approaches for collaboration in 3D and what it means to have presence and multi-user presence in that. Um, I don't think, yeah. Oh yeah, this is working. So I, I think most of you have actually had a chance to see this, but for those who haven't, who have mostly looked uh, on Twitch or Zoom, um, the thing that uh, uh, it lets you do is create a space, lets you create an avatar and explore avatars. It lets you bring things and pull things in from the web. Um, and this is something that has evolved over the past year in particular, um, starting off again from the question about whether we thought we could build it. Um, and that, that's one of the things we had really figured out was um, what it took for us to build the platform by which we could then do experiments. Now, at this point, um, it's interesting to take a look at uh, how that has showed up here. So um, again, this is the first VR, IEEE VR that I, I'm aware of that was actually being held online. Um, and we have the visitors from a number of different countries who didn't necessarily have to travel to do that, um, from the US, from Japan, China, Germany, France, many others. Um, we have some early numbers on what the active users are. Um, I was always trained that you want to look at both the quantitative and the qualitative data. And so from a quantitative point of view, we, there are, have been around 4,000 active users coming in and out. Um, we haven't done a whole lot of analysis yet on what that means, um, but I, I think it will be interesting as a way for us to really understand um, the, the use, the engagement, how people interact with together. Um, but the part I love actually is really trying to understand the different qualitative differences in this. So um, for instance, with permission, uh, this is an example from uh, one of the workshops that we had, uh, the Women in VR workshop that uh, Diane Hausfeld and others uh, put together. Um, and Dan Fernie Harper uh, helped us with some of the, the uh, image grams. Um, and this is a very interactive session, right? Um, you have all been to workshop sessions where there are discussions and you are, are meant to be able to have some side conversations, be able to talk about things uh, that are in the world around you. Um, it's very different than what you are experiencing right now, which is effectively a talking head talking to you. Right? Um, we've also had uh, panels where it's a bit more of uh, a set of people talking. Um, and this to me has actually been really interesting. Um, I went to a, a couple of talks and panels and it was a funny combination because when, I, when I've been to VR before, you look over in the crowd and I say, oh, look, there's Ron Azuma or you know, I see Joe or Steve Finer. Um, and when I've been having some of these other experiences, particularly with, uh, um, some of the streaming services, it didn't feel like you had the same kind of spatial engagement. Um, and so it wasn't quite the interactive part, um, but you could stop somebody after the talk and engage them. And you still had some of that serendipitous experience um, and interesting choices in terms of how people choose to represent themselves. Um, this one is more around uh, some of the talks, so kind of similar to the previous one. And then the, the, the last one that was particularly interesting was the poster sessions. So uh, there was a, a test of this before at WIS um, of poster sessions. And 
think one of the things that Lars Bergstrom pointed out that was really important is, uh, yes, it's true that we've been forced into some of this because we have not been able to travel. Um, I, I would love to have been able to uh, attend uh, IEEE VR myself physically, but we can't. And there are many people who just couldn't anyway, either because of cost, because of travel restrictions, because of uh, their, where they are in society, many, many different reasons. Um, and this has opened it up to all of those people in an interesting way. Um, and so the discussions I've had in the closer session have been fantastic. Uh, and so it's been exciting for us to see that and to learn. And so again, to the learning. Um, first, you know, a lot of the research we do starts off with systems and understanding whether it's possible or not. Um, and, and again, we had a number of people say, well, no, not possible. There's no way you could build that into the web. And the team has been amazing at actually doing that. So we have a platform to learn. So we have a way for us to actually figure out the interactions and where things work. Another piece of this is that the mashups are rich experiences, and this is directly from something that comes from the web. That is, uh, one of the things that I love about the web is you can take all these different sources, you put them together, and you have something new. Uh, it's sort of the, the equivalent of memes, um, but really with the live pieces of that. And because this is inherently on the web, um, we've seen fantastic mashups where people will pull things in from all around the web uh, and use that even as new forms of communication and, um, where this is a thing we wanna talk about. This is a video we wanna see, hey, let me bring this in. Um, and it doesn't have to be built in in some constrained controlled way. It just works because it's inherently part of the web. There's another piece of that, which is um, around consent and the moderation and how we interact. And it's one of the things that we talk about a lot, um, both in the foundation and in our research work is where things have been challenging or where they went wrong uh, with the internet today. And uh, those are things we can experiment with, in particular around people's individual space, a consent, who gets to put what in a, a, a space, being very clear about the kind of spaces that you have. And some of this work has been explored before. Um, there, there's plenty of work, uh, even early on by Benford about the, the personal space and auras and things like that. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, the world has changed so much, our, our, our assumptions about it have changed so much that it feels new. And being able to build that uh, the, these as a, um, as a primary aspect, a primary factor of the system itself um, has been important for us to learn and be able to, to work on. There's a lot of work on identity choices. Um, the, in some ways, the, the initial system because it is fairly simple means that there's a lot of expression. I have seen uh, just even over the last couple of days, everything, uh, and thank you, there are a couple of researchers who pointed this out to me, um, everything from uh, a standard avatar identity um, to uh, someone representing themselves as a rock. Uh, and we, we know this from many online systems in terms of re representation and identity. Um, but again, uh, the openness and freedom for people to explore that um, and that particular time means that it feels like there's new learning. And I think there are some real questions around that. Um, we have some cohorts, early adopters, who it's incredibly important for them to be able to control and manage their identity. Um, we've talked to some folks who are non-technical and uh, in some cases, it's important for them to know who's really there or they, don't, they want the avatar to have a very clear representation of them, almost like video. Um, and so there is this interesting thing happening, particularly in this time, between representations that you see 
in uh, say a 2D video system like Zoom and the representations that we see in a lot of our uh, online systems, whether that was you know, historically in Second Life or you know, more currently in hubs or any of the other avatar systems. And what, what I'm excited about is that means that it gives us a chance to actually learn um, and really understand which situations are best fit. And what I mean by that is, if you looked at the examples that uh, I gave, um, and again, thank you, Dan, for getting those up and ready. Uh, each one of them really is a different social situation. Each one of them has different interaction characteristics. Each one of them has different identity characteristics. And we, we need to understand what is best fit for uh, different kinds of VR, what's best fit for AR. Um, some of the work that uh, Hervoye Benko and team have done, both Microsoft and uh, at Oculus Research, I think are really interesting in terms of representation of the real person in the space um, in contrast to avatars. The work in, in contrast in 2D video and where that fits and it works best. Right now, I think many of you are uh, watching this in a 2D video and then afterwards we'll have a discussion that is more interactive and that will be in uh, VR. Um, and then finally, the, the, the other modalities. And so looking at the situations and the fit and what seems to work best for that. Um, and I don't want to lose the potential vision for this because it, again, you know, when I talk to um, people about their use of hubs, and it's the range from early adopters to um, people who really are almost technophobic, um, this comes up a lot, right? Um, which is, you know, the, the Jedi High Council where it feels like everybody's in the room together. And I think there is both that and the ability to control your space. Um, when I talked to Evo uh, a little bit earlier about some of the work that they had done at USC previously, where you have a drumming circle, for instance, that calls for a different space, different representations. Um, and so I don't want us to stop here. I want us to actually use this as a bridging point where we grow from that. So look, I, I'm, I've shared our experiments, uh, our learning and insights about developing the platforms the, for mixed reality in a connected world. Um, and really, I, I hope that you uh, uh, think about this because I, I really do believe there's a bright future in a world beyond the screens where we are not all just staring down at our phones. Um, but I did want to lean into something, which is that our world has an additional challenge today uh, that we can't ignore. Um, I pulled this recently, um, and it was interesting because I had written this um, when I was first asked, which was, uh, everyone here is remote. And as I write these words, a week before the actual keynote, um, it's possible that we'll all be sheltering at home by the time I say this to you. Um, for those in academia, you may not be able to return to your institution. For those in industry, you might not be able to return to your offices. For all of us, our lives have changed. Turns out, by the way, that that was true. Um, but that that is the opportunity. Um, the opportunity is our need to be connected. And it has a new urgency that was not necessarily here a month before. So I just wanted to leave with a few, a few final thoughts. Um, one about the open platform for experimentation, inviting you all to join us for that. Um, and again, not just because uh, many folks are now um, separated or forced to be separated, but because there are also communities that can't always travel, that have different time zones and geography. And we need to be pushing on this connectedness more to bring more people in. Um, to, in the long term, really moving beyond the screen. I know I've said it many times. I am a true believer that you know, we want experiences over apps. And uh, I know that the, this research community can help us create a lot of that. Um, but in this moment, I think that the question is really how VR, 3D UI, and AR can help, how that can connect people. I know there's important work here. Um, both to increase the boundaries of scientific knowledge and to have real impact on people's lives today and in the future. And one that has 
they become increasingly unknowable. But what is knowable is that we will need new solutions to provide connection and presence and empathy in a time where more people than ever will be isolated. And so each and every one of us has the ability to research those solutions and have real impact in the world. And my question to all of you is what will you create to do that? Uh, so thank you for your time, your attention, uh, and uh, love to either take questions now or we can hop into uh, Hub's room and uh, have discussions there. Okay. So I think we're back. Are we back, Anton? Okay. So uh, thank you, Sean. Um, so we've got a few questions. Uh, we have some time for questions. We've got a few questions up on the Slido. If you haven't been looking at it, I'll give you a chance to pull it up, Sean. If you haven't, uh, uh, <laughs> people who are listening haven't been looking at it, um, reminder, go to Slido and search for the IEEE VR 2020 tag and pop up Sean's uh, keynote. And you can uh, feel free to ask, a, ask some questions. We've got a few there already. Um, so uh, well, yeah, first I'll ask you, Sean, are there any that any any one of these that you'd like to uh, dive into first? Have you got it up yet? Uh, I thought I had it up, but it's gone here. Oh wait, yep, now I've got it up. So no, give me a second there. to skim those and yep. uh, and see if there's any you'd like to bite off before uh, we dive on the rest of them. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I, actually, I'm I'm happy to dive into the the first one because you know. Um, I think it's really important. Um, the first, uh, and I'll repeat it for those who don't see it, right? um, unless you want to repeat it later. I'll, 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 I'll ask it. So uh, <laughs> someone asked, I appreciate Mozilla's work on privacy, and yet a significant amount of your revenue comes from Google, which means your, uh, that surveillance capitalism is still a big part of, part of your income. So can you talk about how XR fits into the future economic models of Mozilla? Yeah, sure. Um, so one, it, it's true, we have a large part of our income uh, coming from Google. Uh, and we see, a, in my mind, a, an important opportunity, particularly in the mixed reality space, um, to explore other ways in which there are economic ecosystems. It's what I was talking about when we were talking about the creator compensation. We have an experiment right now which is more about compensation based on attention. Um, and those systems are more decentralized. That means that we can actually look at how the conceptual model for um, browsing, interacting with the world changes and how value exchange changes. Um, so in my mind, actually, uh, XR, mixed reality, all of this is exciting because it's it's a place for us to do some of the alternative experimentation, the other ways in which we do it. So the, I'll, I'll just follow up on that. So the, the experiment you talk about is the one using, or we're doing stuff with coil um, as one example. Yeah. Um, but can you imagine um, sort of the broader, broader question of, of sort of Mozilla's income, right? So there's, I feel like there's two sides to the, to the compensation system. One is helping, is the advertising based model in general, which the attention based model is trying to solve. The other is thinking about diversification and uh, uh, how a company like Mozilla can actually survive in, in this, this ecosystem as well, which I think was also what the question was getting at. Yeah, we can. Uh, I mean, I'm, I think it's a very real question and one that we spend a lot of um, cycles on. Um, I mean, there's. Uh, the, the question was sort of around XR and where that looks as a new opportunity, right? And so right. Um, we, we still look at things like, for instance, um, non-surveillance capitalism advertising models, right? Because there are, there are ways to do that which actually still respect people's privacy and still there's a value exchange. We look at direct value exchange. Um, the COIL experiment is a good example of that. Um, and we'll, we'll look at other models as well, whether that is potential subscriptions um, or some of the sort of uh, different ways in which we might build that. 
Um, and what's interesting is that as we do those experiments, some of those can propagate to the browser itself, the, the 2D desktop browser. Um, uh, in my mind, that, that's actually a win. That means that the, some of the experimentations that we do in these future systems propagates out to the many hundreds of millions of people who use those systems today. Um, uh, and the question in my mind is actually whether there are things in um, mixed reality that are unique that um, might replace that in the, the long term. Um, and that I don't know, but it's definitely the kind of thing we do. Um, I will add one last part in here, which is that um, I mentioned before, it's a nonprofit, right? We get to make choices and we do make choices all the time that preserve people's privacy. That's everything from uh, the Facebook container um, uh, or the way that we handle uh, ETP and tracking. And to be clear, those have impacts on revenue. Those are not choices you would make if you were uh, just running a business, but they are choices that you would make when you are trying to do the best possible user experience and really look out for the user. So thank you. So the one of the other the next question actually uh, uh, that Ed asks. So uh, you know he says compared to setting up an HMD, uh, hubs and browsers been pretty low friction. I think um, WebXR, especially when you're coming from from the browsers, it can be pretty low friction. But uh, in addition to how asking how you've seen uh, potentially the HMD friction decrease as hubs has been developed. What other aspects, maybe both with respect to the web in particular, but also just in general with using uh, VR and head-mounted displays and AR uh, are the most important sources of friction that you think we might be able to minimize and, and, and clean up in the future? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I'll, I'll answer, there, there are two parts of it. One is around hubs and just one around HMDs in general. Um, so um, Hubs was specifically developed to run on multiple platforms and we got that with the web, right? And so I think one of the things that's interesting is you don't necessarily want to depend on only waiting for everybody to have an HMD. And um, so with Hubs, there is the decrease in friction of use inside an HMD and making it faster and better and easier we do things, you know, for instance, being able to send directly from a phone to hubs and so it automatically is going in there. Um, but uh, just even on a, a laptop or a desktop, because it's running in a browser, it just works. And um, that, has been, that has meant that it reduces the friction of use for hubs. The interesting thing to me is I think we would like to see that applied everywhere. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, at least in my mind, uh, if we go back to the old, the, the GOMS model from HCI, right? There, there are so many different things that you have to do. Um, I would like, and we have had some conversations about this, launching directly into browsers. So you are already in the space. So you're already in hubs when you put it on and you aren't doing anything additional. That removes one layer of friction, which is the set of things that it takes to get into an environment that's an open environment. The other one that I talked about a little bit that I think is really interesting is the multimodal interface aspects of it. Um, uh, I don't have good numbers on this, but I think that we there's a fair anecdotal argument, fair evidence argument that um, all of the selections, all of the thing, every time you have to enter a um, a systems control, right? You, think about you know, the Bowman book and the different sort of systems controls that you have to do in here. Every time you do that, um, that is adding additional friction. And so being able to put the device on and already be inside of the hub, being able to use your voice as the initial way to do systems control and communication um, feels like it reduces a significant amount of friction. And those are some of the experiments we'd either like to do ourselves or do in collaboration. And, I don't know if I, I mentioned this before, but we really are interested, again, open systems. We love collaboration. We're not hiding the things that we do. We really want to actually work with lots of people in not just the building of these things, but the experiments and the understanding. Of them. OK, thanks. Uh, so uh, another question is, um, so although Hubs is accessible in many ways, and you just highlighted some of that uh, with this question, 
Um, the functionality that, that, that it gives to you in some ways depends on the device. So uh, uh, I think what Vino is talking about is, you know, in, when you're in a head mount, uh, you get your head bobbing and you get your hands moving. Whereas if you're on the desktop, your avatar tends to stand very still unless you consciously move it. Um, are there other plans uh, or things you can imagine doing to uh, improve the portrayal of nonverbal body language in hubs beyond like emoticons and, and, and simple animations? Um, it's a great question. Uh, the, the, there are a couple of parts to that. One is sometimes we, we have to, uh, again, it's the web and so we can't always predict where something shows up. We have to actually plan for that. And in general, um, the developer does the hard work so the user doesn't have to, right? That's what you would like. Um, and uh, so I expect that there will always be differences, you know, across whether someone has got the, the highest end device or system to something that is more cardboard like or is running on a phone um, I think that's actually the power of this. Uh, having said that, I think there's a, a, a large space for research in what some of the uh, alternatives are for MVB and what that might look like, both in terms of uh, implicit expression and explicit expression. Um, I know that a lot of the asks that we get have to do with things like gaze or gesture or facial features. And you see some of that in different avatars. You can build that into it. But my intuition is that there's more to it than that. Um, and uh, we'd love to see more research on that. How do you, I'm, I'll uh, sort of ask a follow-up on that. When you think about, I think what a lot of people think about are, are gaze and, and, and gesture and so on. Um, how does that intersect with, the, with both what Susan talked about and what you talked about with respect to privacy and the kind of data that we give to applications, right? And give to the platforms. Yep. Um, I think that's the challenge. I, for the most part, I would always like to look at how do we enable people? How do we make a better experience for people? How do we um, you know, augment their cognition and the, their interactions? And then, uh, maybe not and then, and at the same time, find the solution so that we do that in a privacy preserving way, right? Um, and so in some cases that may mean that what we're doing is uh, you know, some of the kinds of exchanges that we do today around passwords or private information um, so that, uh, that it never actually gets fully uh, uh, um, unbundled, but you can use that in the interaction. So I think of that as one of the, the challenges for us to be able to do. And again, it's one of the reasons why I like to have positive actors in the space because the default is, uh, you know, we made this thing, we're not gonna worry about it. We're not gonna think about what that is. Um, so again, I think that's a, a really interesting and open area for research. So there's sort of two questions. So I'll, uh, I'll sort of bundle them. Uh, one person asked, do we expect to have uh, VR meetings in the future? And then someone else sort of asked that second half of that, which is if we, you know, if people, uh, if in the future people tend to favor virtual experiences over real ones, so if we start having more and more of these meetings uh, virtually, uh, do you think this will cause problems um, and how should we prepare for it? So A, do you think that we're gonna be having more meetings and, and experiences and so on in VR in the future? And uh, what are the problems and opportunities and how should we prepare for it? Yep. Um... I do think that we'll, uh, and again, especially in these times, we will have more um, meetings in VR and the, the gamut, right? Um, I expect over time more in VR, more in AR, more in all of the different systems and the bridges across those systems, right? We already have people who call in sometimes versus are there in a video versus there physically. And the, the mixing of that, I think, is one of the interesting challenges. Um, is, the, the organization I am with today, uh, over 40% of the people were remote already. And so there are, there are processes and tools that you learn to do that. Um, I think there's a, another interesting aspect of that, which is that um, we want to really lean into what it means for us to maintain our humanity as we do that. All of the empathy, all of the things that we get when we gather together 
um, there is a if you if you want to see the extreme, um, and I, I tend not to I tend not to lean towards the dystopian. I, uh, I I like to think of myself as a pragmatic idealist, right? Um, but uh, there's a, a wonderful story by E.M. Forrester called The Machine Stops. And just two seconds on it, because I, I think it's a good read if you want to be thinking about what happens next and after. Um, short science fiction story uh, where everybody is in their own pods. They're all communicating through the machine. They have meetings. There are people who are professors or experts. They're all working through this. And then one day there's a, a glitch with the machine. They don't want to go to the surface of the world because there has been a disease that has taken out the world and everybody's needed to communicate through the machine. Um, but they have started to feel like they lost their humanity. And so I won't spoil the story, but some things happen after that. And the interesting thing about that is uh, it was written in, I think, I want to say 1907. Um, so it's a... Uh, it, <laughs> It was well before the internet, uh, well before VR or conceptualizations of VR, but it had some of the same concerns about what happens when we start to use telecommunication and where, what that means for our humanity. And so again, positive actors in the space to make sure that we are doing that and combining it. It's one of the reasons why I like both VR and AR is that it brings the world around you closer and it brings the virtual world closer. So we probably have time for a few quick things. Um, there's three different questions that all sort of hover around the sort of more technical like uh, things like uh, is hubs coming to HoloLens and uh, uh, things about um, uh, uh, development and one saying, you know, hubs is open source and developers will probably be interested in using the platform and enhancing it. How, how could they uh, build on top of hubs or, or get involved with it? So I think those are all sort of in that same space. Um, I mean, the, the, the answer is uh, an interesting open source answer, which is um, in some way we have a, a relatively small team uh, you know, a research lab of people who work on this and it's an open source project. And so we have a broader community that contributes to it. The more people who are working on it, doing their experiments, being stakeholders in this, the better it becomes for everybody. And so, um, and that, that is stakeholders in academia, stakeholders in industry. It's a way for us to actually all work together to make a thing better and really understand it. And so, um, I'd like to say, yeah, I mean, we, we, we work with companies like Microsoft and Magic Leap um, to explore this, to build it, um, to see what it's like to do that. Um, it gets accelerated and we understand the questions more when there are contributions. And so um, we'd love to have people reach out. Uh, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to uh, Lars Bergstrom who has been here who uh, leads a lot of that work and research, show up uh, in uh, GitHub on Twitter. Um, any of these are good ways to actually engage. And we, we would love to do more experiments, collaborations. I, just directly answering it, yeah, you, you should expect to see that it would show up on more platforms because that's exciting. That actually gets at the overall mission, which is where people are connecting to the internet. We want that to be accessible, we want that to be a public good, and we want users first in the ways that we do it. So there's a, a bunch more questions, um, but I think we're out of time. Um, Sean is going to actually go over into a uh, hubs room that uh, we created for him. Uh, we've, the link's been posted in the keynote-white channel on, uh, on the Slack. Um, so you can go and go to that link. Sean's, uh, you'll find his avatar. It looks very much like him. Uh, in there. I'll pop over there too. But uh, I'm sure he'd love to come and uh, have some of you who've asked some of these questions that are still open um, uh, chat with him directly. Um, otherwise, thank you, Sean. Uh, it was a great, uh, great to hear you talk and uh, look forward to uh, hearing more in the future. Larry, thank you. Uh, it was great to be here. Again, uh, this is a unique moment in time. Uh, and I look forward to meeting some of you and uh, having some conversations, some of these questions.
Okay, so we're gonna have a short break, uh, go and hang out in some hubs rooms, and then uh, please come back for the, the closing uh, uh, remarks, uh, award ceremony, so on. We're going we have some nice uh, prizes for the paper winners that I gave a hint for in in the th in the one of the uh, channels. If you're interested in what those are, otherwise we'll see you in a little while. And uh, thank you again. <laughs>